Hey there teachers, this is going to be about sphere packing, but also the personal workspace, which I go on about quite a bit on Medium. You'll see PWS this, PWS that. PWS <clears throat> stands for personal workspace. And this is my war on poverty. This is my saying, you can't learn, <clears throat> you can't really... Some some subjects, they always say, when you talk about teaching remotely, they say, well, you can't learn that remotely. You have to go somewhere, like auto mechanics or chemistry or, you know, all these hands-on things. But, you know, what does hands-on mean? Is if, if you just need um, a study space and uh, a personal workspace for some subjects, um, you know, that's going to be remote, we could call it. You're there. I mean, I don't know what's remote about it exactly, because you're there. It's kind of like you're sitting in a library. But, you know, who gets access to really good libraries and a study carol where you can just sit? You know how homeless people or people just seeking shelter, they end up in the library a lot. And that should tell us a lot. It's like, imagine turning a whole skyscraper into a, quote, library. But it's the kind you can live in. Oh, what kind is that? Well, we call that a school. We call that a dorm. You go to a university and it's like people are living in piles of books. And they're working hard. But what kind of work is it? We call it study. So work, study comes out of the university. Really, I'm just saying the global university sets the floor in terms of living standards. And if there's a work-study safety net where you get a personal workspace because you need that to study. You can't learn the stuff we're teaching if you don't have a safe place to stay with some privacy, you know. And so the personal workspace ties in here. So we all know about the triangular numbers. Now, I'm not one of those people who goes around thinking that Bucky invented triangular numbers or any of this, right? I uh, love the um, Book of Numbers by Conway and Guy. I recommend Midhat Gazale, <clears throat> the book Nomen, for more on this. But you're basically, <clears throat> you're linking your lexical and your graphical. You're linking algebra, you're linking computer programming to stuff you can diagram and visualize, such as a growing tetrahedron of balls. How many cumulative, how many in each layer. The focus is on the number of balls. But you know, when we study the C60 lattice or Alexander Graham Bell's lattice or Bucky's lattice, differently named, differently patented, differently architected in various ways, um, we can also talk about the total inventory of edges that are going to be needed. And this animated GIF hints at those edges, but it's really just showing what I'll call the circumferential or the surface edges. And it's with reference to a specific shape, right? It's when you talk about the number of edges in a growing what? You have to fill in the blank there. A growing what? Cuboctahedron in this case. But what about just a growing tetrahedron? And how does that work? Do you start from the center? I think you start from an apex. And you grow down, right? So one, four... So to start, there would be six edges, right? The three on the bottom and the three from the apex sphere to each of the base spheres, if we call it a base. So six is your starting point. And then you're adding another set of edges to connect to the next layer. Now, how many are in the next layer? Well, you've got the triangular numbers to tell you how many. That's how many balls. But then how do you compute edges? And it actually isn't that hard or that much reasoning in the case of the tetrahedron. And a gentleman who's studying synergetics and has been in touch with me uh, was focused exactly on that, this question about edges and asked me if I knew of any simple formulae for how many edges in sphere packings of this nature. And that took me down a bit of a rabbit hole. Uh, we both, I think, had a similar idea for the tetrahedron. What about the half octahedron? What about the full octahedron? So I've mentioned the cube octahedron so far, but I haven't talked about the half octahedron or the octahedron, which are actually 
simpler. So to think about, at least reason about for me. So I went through some rational process and then would look up my results in the online encyclopedia for integer sequences, which has a process now that I could use. I could sign up for an account and I could add my findings because although the sequences are there and the one for the tetrahedron is explicit, um, the two others for the half octa and the octa, they don't mention sphere packing kissing points, which is what we're counting. The number of kissing points between spheres in a half octahedron of n minus one spheres along an edge, something like that. That's explicit in the case of the um, tetrahedron only so far that I found. And I haven't actually checked for the cube octahedron because I haven't really done the work to get those that that number. It's not it would take more reasoning and so forth. Now you'd think I already had a um an account on this OEIS because hey it already links to my website like here about Fuller and the virus and all that that whole chapter interesting stuff good reading comes from the 1990s I try to just curate my work from back then I don't go in here and make changes really so you can see what's always been here since the 90s or so. Let's see, did I date this page? Possibly not, but you can use the Wayback Machine and stuff. It doesn't go back to 66, obviously. This is the web. That's a picture from Life Magazine in 1966. They're just figuring out about the nucleocapsid. Now, coronavirus doesn't have one of those in the nucleus surrounding the RNA. It doesn't have that. Um, it has a, it's got that fatty ball though, and the spikes sure it does. Okay. So what I'm saying is you need, uh, a serious computer. It could be in the cloud, but you know, you need at least like a cubicle in a building that you can also sleep in somewhere. Maybe there, I don't know. You need a room, you need a place, you need protection from the elements and you need access to file systems and, you know, the wherewithal to play simulations, computer games, whatever. You know, you need to be dealt in at a minimum standard. When I say the global university sets that standard, right? And, and, and so we can't, we being, I don't know, people who say they're doing the work can't really claim to be doing that. Like, we're not really teaching you if we don't give you the space to learn, right? We're pretending to. But really, we're just starving you or bombing you, or really, we're hoping you'll fail. We're working against you if we're not working for you, I guess. I guess we could say. So do I want to um, put these discoveries in the Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences? I thought about it. I haven't created an account. Like I was going to say a second ago, that reference to me that we were just looking at for the cube octahedral numbers, uh, I didn't put it there. I was proud that it was put there by somebody. Like this was towards the beginning of the encyclopedia and Webb was young. And on a couple of these sequences, I got to be there. Like the cumulative one might have me also. Because I've been into the cumulative number of spheres in these shapes. Like on my own, it's been like my own research, right? Partly inspired by all the synergetics. But even before, like in high school, I was kind of interested in sequences. If you dig out my ad admit papers to uh, application file at Princeton, I noticed I put something about that in there. I went and looked at my application at one point. Because you were allowed to, so why not? Anyway, uh, so I've never actually added to this myself. I don't have an account here, and I haven't dive-bombed into it, and those references there to me now aren't ones that I put in there. So that's all by way, I guess you could say, an excuse for why I'm not putting these paragraphs that uh, number of contact points between equal spheres arranged in an octahedron with n minus 1 spheres in each edge. That's this OES... 758. Let's take a look. 
My main point, though, is this kind of research and fun where you're connecting sphere packing to computer programming, it's pretty obvious. I didn't invent it. Bucky didn't invent it. Conway and Guy talk about it a lot in the Book of Numbers. Midhat Gazale, the book Nomen. It's like if you want to do some serious um, teaching of mathematics, start with the whole idea of number sequences that have meaning. There, are, there's over like four. There's almost four hundred thousand sequences in this database. That's not, not quite that many, right? We can scroll to the bottom. It says somewhere here. 343,409 sequences as of today in this particular database. So, and look how simple it is to 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 create a sequence, right? So, and this one is the one I was talking about. Which one is this? 758. So that turns out to be the same as the number of contact points between equal spheres arranged in an octahedron with n minus spheres on each edge. So that's the number of contact points. Same as the number of edges, which works for C60 as well. This is C60. Now you know that in a lot of these uh, octet truss lattice designs, it's just center to center connection direct, right? Center ball, center of ball A to the three below it. This, this more interesting and forgiving in a way system, this more um, nuanced approach gives you a different kind of flexibility and so forth, but it's still the same numbers. The counts can be the same. You've got one ball to ball interaction per neighbor. So if you're down here in the center somewhere, you're going to have 12 spokes to your 12 neighbors, right? If you're totally buried. If you're on a boundary, then it, the number varies. And that's what makes this easier, hard to think about. You know, when you reason about it, going down layer by layer is what I recommend. You can do that same approach for the cube octahedron figure out how many edges and but get it right. I'm not introducing that as a sequence either, nor have I decided to comment on these, but there is a growing co uh, cube octahedron. How many edges? You know, this is the CCP. Again, Fuller didn't invent it. It's just core to synergetics and it's linked to Avogadro's number because it's, it's uh, the archetype here, if you're thinking like a tarot card, this is the archetype of pure uniformity. It's like every sphere has 12 around it. It's the maximum density. It's not the dorky, um, key, uh, it's not the simple cubic packing, for example. If you have a better idea for how to show uniformity in, you know, and I know in a noble gas, everything's moving around, but you could say the average positions or just the coordinate system or the reference frame, why wouldn't it be like a sphere packing matrix, right? There's nothing weird about that. So you put that in with synergetics and you put in the volumes table that gives the rhombic dodecahedrons a volume of six. You're not doing anything like really perverse here. You're doing something rather ra rational and logical and using sphere packing in general as a way to introduce some coding language doesn't have to be anyone in particular. That is such an obvious thing, right? I'm sure many curricula besides this one take that approach. Makes perfect sense. All right, so, but you need the right equipment. You need, you need, not all of us live in a big city. And not all of, us, all of us have the bandwidth. So there's lots to talk about there. Lifestyles are at the, at the core of the global you. What are the lifestyles we offer? All right. And by the way, speaking of studying, what I'm reading these days is a most dangerous method. And this is about uh, Freud and Carl Jung and all those folks. It connects to Otto Weninger and that connects to Wittgenstein's youth. So the tie in between Wittgenstein's Vienna and Wittgenstein reads Weninger, that's the title I have. And now these authors, very interesting. Vienna Circle is 
a beginning point. This ties in Zurich, but it's a beginning point for a lot of our curriculum too. Like uh, it's kind of the Adam Curtis angle because from the Freudians and from the psychologists in general, we develop what you might want to call mass psychology, right? It's less to do with therapy for so-and-so and more to do with how do we get millions of people to buy Kleenex or whatever. Okay. Is that a trim tab? In other words, to the trim tab book club, I posed the question, what is the role in the tools of persuasion? If you remember the hunger project, the premise there was there is enough food. It's psychologically that we're not in the right headspace to really help the humans. We're still bots from a previous age with outdated obsolete programming. So what kind of mirror do we need to hold up to free us of our um, roboticness, right? What kind of ad campaign? What kind of propaganda? Let's call it that. Do we need to snap out of it? How are we going to get ourselves to where we're less dorky? And this was going to address that. There's going to be ad campaigns that were very psychological. You could call them manipulative, but we're doing it to ourselves, right? It's like, yeah, we're... We're trying to talk ourselves into being better human beings. We're going to use the tools of the psychologists and the advertisers. No holds barred. Like everything that advertisers already permit themselves when trying to brainwash you to buy soda pop, we're going to use all those tools to brainwash you to want to help get everybody fed. And there was a lot of pushback there. People are like, well, you're not really actually shipping food to hungry people, are you? No, we're leaving that to like Oxfam and stuff. We're going to focus on advertising. Well, that's pretty cynical, isn't it? Well, is it? Really? Is it? Or is it trim tabby? You're focusing on where you have some leverage, right? Anyway, questions for future discussion. Hang in there, everyone. I hope you have a great day. I'll get my mom her second COVID shot today. Out at the airport.